um, or some, in some cases, as in Rwanda, they kill them first. Um, so uh, you want to, um, you, the, your work has, it automatically has inflammatory possibilities. Yeah. In the applications of the Liz Lerman method for talk facts that I've experienced in theater, mm -hmm. they always say, start with something you liked. First tell us something positive, and then tell us something negative. Yeah, and then have you noticed the big pauses that follow that? Not usually. Oh, really? Well, most of the time when I've been there, hmm. it's like, oh, wait, I had a question to ask, and I was confused about something, and now they want me to say something positive first. Okay. <laughs> so, it, it, again, you, got, you want to get what you want, and you only have 25 or 30 minutes to do it. Yeah. Um, just a little about the, as far as Liz Lerman, I know that uh, it's also done sometimes in works in progress. Yeah. And like whatever, that's a different thing. But um, also, I know Michael Rode, um, he's a really cool. I love um, Michael Rode. Yeah, which I facilitator. He, he asked a couple questions in the talk back once to the audience, which I found compelling. Um, windows, he called it windows and mirrors. Mm -hmm. um, where is you as an audience member? And then um, where did you um, have a window into another person's perspective that you were surprised by or you, know, you connected to somebody in a way you didn't expect to? That's, that is terrific. But, you know, a lot of people these days are writing plays about people that are not particularly likable. And so you, if you're asking them to empathize with, you know, Lady Macbeth, they don't want to do that. <laughs> they don't want to go there. So, um, so in some ways, the character that is like you, I mean, if you said, you know, who's the character that's most like your mother-in-law, that might be some, you know, a different approach. But, um, but I've had uh, post-play discussions where people have said, I've had many post-play discussions like this, um, where people have said, um, this isn't a play. I didn't like anybody. <laughs> oh, well, you know what? That's kind of the point. Um, and I'm being sarcastic when I say that. What I would actually say in that, again, I would chase the question down in the actual post-play discussion. Um, and I often have a little speech about how playwriting is not about writing people that are likable. It's about writing people that are interesting. Yeah. If I'm remembering correctly, when Lisa Kalki was telling me about how the Liz Lerman stuff started being applied to play discussions, it was mm -hmm. at the public because they were having a, a real problem with people. Is that the that's, public? That's that's what, if I'm remembering correctly. Well, Mr. Papp was still alive? No, no, they, were, they, were having exactly. a they were having difficulty with um, people coming to the talkbacks to kind of outdo each other with destroying the play. Oh, yes, and there was is. very little that was being communicated that was positive. Right. So they implemented that as a tool to try and get a balance of feedback. So it wasn't just... Actually, I know what you're talking about, and it wasn't at the was public. That? It was at the uh, uh, National Playwrights Conference. Okay. It was at the O'Neill. Okay. Yeah, that right. was during the Lloyd Richards era, um, because the, there were uh, mm -hmm. critics there masquerading as dramaturgs um, <laughs> who were giving negative feedback. But if, it, but if you've already got a nurturing environment or the, or the audience is, is you know, being somewhat civilized and balanced, then it, then it can push it the other way, and, and then you're only getting positive feedback. Then you feedback don't get anything. Useful. I mean, I've had yeah. playwrights who, who don't follow my advice, and they sit up there, and they're just doodling. You know? It's, it's because they have to survive some way, and they'll go nuts. Um, because sometimes it is. Uh, it's too positive. I mean, you guys know how you feel after you've done the first draft. You think it's perfect? No. So you don't want everyone to say, oh, I love this. When are you going to produce it? I've had that happen at the Bay Area Playwrights Festival. One post-play discussion uh, was like, uh, when is the magic going to produce this play? It's like, oh, man, kill me now. I mean, it's not, it's not ready. I know you loved it, but it's not ready. So anyway, yeah. A few times that I've um, had talkbacks, uh, inevitably I always forget something, you know, and it's always an important thing. Like, I always leave 
from the thing, like, oh, why didn't I, you know, why didn't I get some feedback about this? And it always eats me up inside, and I just was wondering if, you know. That's why you have to formulate the questions before you have the reading. Because after the reading, every fiber of your being is, yeah. you're just buzzed. Yeah. Um, and uh, you don't, you can't think straight. It's true. You can't think straight. And uh, so you want to get those questions down after the last rehearsal and before the reading starts. Because that's, that's where the peak information is in terms of questions that need to be answered. So, well, Nisha, what are your thoughts about using the talk back as a way to, in essence, educate the audience about how to uh, interact with plays? I, I think that's very important because more and more and more uh, our audience is aging and the ones who have been taught, like the, the audiences at South Coast Repertory, they have been taught over a period of decades to that pushing the envelope is good and that taking risks is acceptable there. Um, and that, I mean, really, I grew up in Southern California and they did that from the time they were founded in 1964 some of the most obscure experimental works you'd ever want to see. Um, so I do think it's important to educate the audience, and I think if you create those healthy boundaries that I suggested about not, part, not coming up so that you're the target, laying out the guidelines ahead of time, uh, making sure that you formulate specific questions, uh, things like that, I think that you, that you do teach them they do start to understand that they're not part of the process. They're the result. They're part of the result. And a joyous part, and we want to make you happy, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but they need to understand that there's, only, there's one playwright. I saw some more. Yeah. I want to ask about the feel and reflective feedback. Know if you have thoughts on that. Uh, part of how the field works is the playwright doesn't ask questions. And if I remember correctly, that's because asking questions sort of directs the audience into what you want them to say. I, I hope I'm getting that correct if anybody else has done the field, uh, because it's about, ref it's about the experience of the playwright's work and voicing that. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on I, I'm just not, I'm just unclear on what the question What the field is? I didn't, didn't know if you had any thoughts on the field. As, as what is part, the field? What's the field? Yeah. Which, it's a process that also came from dance that is yeah. similar to Liz Lerman, but it's that the, 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 the mandate is the playwright, writer, dancer doesn't formulate questions because that is, in essence, limits what the audience feedback is going to be and you might miss something crucial because if you have three questions and they get answered there might be this big old question hanging out there that nobody voices because you haven't asked the right question. It's about the audience giving their experience it's, and it's specifically again you don't, don't tell the play playwright how to fix it it's not about you know it's good or it's not about judgment it's about the experience of the work. I don't this know, is from it, dance? Uh, originally started with dance. There are playwriting groups that, and writing groups Apples that use it oranges. now. Okay, okay. Apples and oranges, I, you know. Okay. If they want to talk about the space, then I can, I'll give them the phone number of the scenic designer or something. But I, 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 don't, uh, I don't understand that concept of, of, I mean, borrowing, changing things from, from the Liz Lerman and from the dance world, that's great. But I don't know that term, the field, so I shouldn't okay. really. Yeah, Roberta. Yeah, um, piggybacking on that prior question, is, I've been a lot of really crappy talkbacks because I didn't know your technique, thank you. Um, and often non-professional audiences, and this is really painting with a usually broad brush, don't have much helpful to say because they haven't been trained, da, da, da. Is there an optimal audience response that you shoot for? Like, what kinds of questions do audiences have that you find helpful or useful or 
Like what, what kinds of responses do you get using your techniques that actually help the playwright? Because I haven't experienced a whole lot of that yet. So people actually well, ask me. I, you know, this is everybody's different. Sure. You know, Heather McDonald is different from Nilo Cruz, is different from Marlena Meyer, is different from Derek Cloud, is different from Roger Gwinder Smith. I mean, I, you know, everybody is radically different. So I don't think that there is any universal question. The only thing that I find myself coming back to over and over and over again that I think helps in both ways, in both directions, is this idea of good confusion and bad confusion. Um, because bad confusion is you get so confused that you give up and you sit back in your chair and you fall asleep or you, you know, check your email or, you know, it, 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 the posture is one of slumping. Um, good confusion, you kind of go, what? And it's one of, the, the, so that the work is being encountered between the audience and the, art, and the piece of art. It's being encountered there. It's not anybody lobbing all the way to one side and all the way to the other. It really is, you're, you're, you've got the synergy going between you. So I find that when I say good confusion to an audience, they're like, what? You mean it's okay to be confused? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and it, it helps the playwrights too, especially if they want the audience to do work to get to the play. Now, you don't always want that. Uh, in most of the work that I've done, you want that. So, I don't know. Again, everybody's different. Yeah, sir, in the back. I think I've ever seen this, but have you ever tried a round table of audience members uh, talking to each other and just overhearing them? Like a focus group? Yeah. <laughs> uh, marketing people do that. Who's that? Marketing people do that, oh, have focus know. groups. Uh, I haven't seen it. Yeah. I've, uh, I've never, I've heard of it. I attended when I was at Berkeley Rep. We had uh, focus groups, and I nearly jumped out of my skin because they, mostly because there's just a misunderstanding of what the play is supposed to do for them, which gets back to the teaching thing again. So that's, um, I'm not sure that, I don't know how productive that would be, but I really don't know. Greg, did you have something? Yeah. Can you talk about? The ideal, um, like case studies, instances where you feel an audience feedback session. I'm not talking about a Sundance artistic staff feedback session, okay. but an audience feedback se session really yielded tangible, transformative, for one of a better, successful results. That you you noted that the, the audience feedback session helped and changed the play. The the one that stands out in my mind. Oh, well, there's two. One of them um, was at Berkeley Rep, which is a space of 400 seats. Um, and we did a play by Quincy Long called The Virgin Molly. And the story of the play is it takes place in, um, in what used to be called the Queer Hut on a Marine base. And um, if they suspected that a Marine was gay, they would send this Marine to the queer hut and essentially sort of interrogate him to find out if he was gay or not. In this play, this uh, young uh, Marine is sent to the queer hut and um, is, gone, is, is put through all of these. He has to march, he has to run with a, a mattress on his head. And I mean, uh, Quincy, uh, the playwright um, actually was in the Marine Corps, so he's not totally making this stuff up. And, um, and then you find out that crowds are gathering outside. And, um, and you find out that the Marine, uh, uh, Private Molly, um, is pregnant. And he gives, at the end, the end of the play, he gives birth to a child that is gender neutral. And it is a transformative play. But I remember uh, at a post-play discussion, this man stood up. There was a lot of controversy because this was in, this would have been in the late 80s. 
So the play was not, you know, it was not easy to take. And I remember this gentleman stood up and he was just angry. And he said, I don't think this is true. I, I, and he's wearing a leather jacket. He says, I, I, I was in the Marines and I'm gay and this just didn't affect me at all. <laughs> and I, it was just so, I mean, I'm not often at a loss for what to say, but this, this was one of those moments where you just say, and, and I said, well, I, I, I think you did have a response. Um, you know, I, I don't know what it is exactly, but I, I'm getting response from you. So I think that that was, um, that was not a play in development, actually. That was during the regular run of the world premiere. But I told Quincy about it, and you know, it's uh, that was what I considered to be a very important moment for both the audience and the, and for Quincy. But people have been scared of that play, and they never did it. Um, successful for the playwright, I do remember many many years ago I had a uh, post play discussion for a play called Etta Jenks by Marlena Meyer. This was in Los Angeles. And um, it was during a festival. So there were civilians and there were professionals. And um, in the post-play discussion, somebody talked about the character uh, not being likable. Because it's a, it's a play about a young woman who comes to Los Angeles to be in the film industry and some scumbucket convinces her that the way, the fastest way to become a star is to do porn. And so she becomes a porn actress, and actually she becomes very, very good at it um, and loses her soul. So we were having a discussion about that, and someone did say this, this not unfrequently heard remark about, um, well, I don't even like these people. Uh, and I said, well, you know, this isn't Arthur Miller. You are, <laughs> this, is not good, this is not a story that wants to end happily. This is a warning. You know, so, um, and that was very, I think that was very important to Marlena in terms of her future work. Um, because she was writing about, as she calls it, the bugs out when you lift up the rock. Mm -hmm. She was writing about that. And, and I think this gave her um, a little bit more solidarity about continuing to write in that way. Am I answering anything, Greg? <laughs> If you keep it going, yes, it it really can keep it. But but like I said, you have to have a dramaturg or someone who is up there, and you have to be in a theater that is willing to perhaps alienate somebody by this dramaturg saying, "Yeah, okay, that was really good." But <laughs> do is anybody have another question? Um, so it, it's you know it's jumping into the deep end. But um, yes, I think if you keep them going. It's, it's very educational for everybody. And uh, my memory is that the most successful post-play discussions I had were for the Bay Area Playwrights Festival. Um, again, a mix of civilians and professionals. Um, and just keeping it going, playwright not visible, not letting the actors, you know, all of this sort of little toolbox I gave you. Um, if, if you keep it going, if the person, uh, it's like, um, yeah, you can't have somebody sit back and just be ready to call it at 30 minutes. You need to have a dramaturg or a director, it can be, who really loves your play and, uh, and is going to ask the questions that you need answered and is going to pursue, chase them down, chase down those responses, even if they're negative. You are asked a question. Yes. Um, I actually, I have a question. Do you think that maybe audiences that you talk about should be a little bit better informed? I had an experience at Los Angeles in a social theater where I had two plays in competition, 
And um, the second night, the second play, somebody in the audience says, this reminds me a lot of a play I saw last night. And it was my play. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the night before. And it turned out that he was one of the judges oh, for no. the competition. And he had fallen asleep during the second play. Oh. So I, you know, I wish that I had a dramaturg there to direct it because I felt like you're, you're judging me and you're not even aware that it's the same person listening to the program who wrote the play yesterday. Wow. So I mean, I was hoping that somebody would have said, uh, excuse me, he's here and it is the same play, but nobody said anything. Yeah, you, I mean, you know, the, the, it's, it's very interesting because I've been having a lot of conversations with David Dower about a convening that he wants to do around literary managers and dramaturgs and w how they feel about being gatekeepers. Well, I, you know, first of all, we don't have any power. We're not a gatekeeper, for heaven's sakes. We're the people who read your play. The artistic director probably never reads your play. Perhaps even up to the first day of production. So, um, you want somebody who's going who's gonna to fight for you. Your yeah, and we are the ones in the theaters that are supposed to be fighting for you. Are you cheap? I, I personally am cheap, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But, it's, but it, you're, it, you're not going to find a lot of the dramaturgs that are coming up now. See, I didn't go to graduate school as a dramaturg. There was no such thing. Uh, I went as a director, and then I switched over because I thought playwrights were so much nicer than actors. And, uh, I, I just liked you guys better. And, uh, but I don't have any training, so nobody ever taught me that I should sit back and just say when the 30 minutes is up. And most of the writers that I was working with early on, primarily at the Los Angeles Theater Center, so this is Marlena Meyer, Jose Rivera, Milcha Sensor, Scott, you're from Los Angeles, you may Originally. remember remember them. Um, and uh, uh, I was fighting for them to have a, have a career. So it wasn't just about the one play and the one post-play discussion. I, I valued them, and I wanted to make sure that other people had the opportunity to value their work as well. So I, I got really mean. Yes, Ralph. Uh, I really liked your, your, your term, good confusion, you know, bad confusion, because there's always just three questions I want to know. What, what did I miss? In other words, what gap? You know, sometimes when we're writing, it's, it's in our head. But you we know, don't, it doesn't it, get it, on the page. It didn't get on the page. Yeah. So yeah. I want to know, What's, what's the missing gap, if there are any? Mm -hmm. uh, what worked? And did anything touch you? And after that, everything else is gravy. But I like the way you get at that by talking about, by having someone talk about confusion and, and, and responding to the confusion. Because it gets to, like you said, the, it gets to my question of what did I miss? What did I miss, yeah. Well, and it also gets to my question of what worked, because sometimes I it does. want, oh, good. It worked. They yeah. were totally thrown by that. They're so confused. That's what I wanted, maybe. So I, I like those terms. I hadn't thought of it. Yes. Yeah, really see, they're they are contradictory terms. Good confusion. You don't usually think. Um, uh, which is why it, the audience, the people who are participating in the post-play discussion, are then they. There's a little moment of alertness. They're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. And uh, and so they are a little bit more disarmed. And can and can divulge the um, what they liked about it. What they liked about it. Yeah, back there. Um, I have two two quick questions. The first one is: Is it ever useful to poll the audience? Like, if, if you're managing a feedback session or talk back, is it ever useful to say if somebody says I was confused about something to poll the entire room and see if everyone had the confusion? And then the second question is. An open-ended question like, what do you think the play was about? Is that a useful discussion starter, or is that intrusive? I think what, what if, if you, the playwright, can bear that, <laughs> then I, I have often started post-plays like that, um, when, usually when they are a little bit more experimental in form, um, or if the playwright has been struggling with the sequencing of the storytelling or something like that, then I have what is this play about? And you know, you have to sit there for a few minutes after you say that. And I usually, uh, as you can tell, I usually crack a joke and I say, uh, you know, it's been three minutes since the play was over. If you can't summarize it, then I don't know what we're going to do. Um, so, uh, but I have used that question and it, it can be very productive, yeah. 
And what was the first? The polling of an audience. Like if a person says, I was confused, and somebody else says, I wasn't confused, then polling the whole room and say who was confused or. I have done that. I have done that. I think it's, uh, it's more educational. Again, it's something that really is more educational for the audience than it is for the playwright. Because most of the time, the person who didn't get it will be outnumbered. And, uh, and they'll, you know, whoa. Or if it, com if it comes up in a way that I don't like, <laughs> then, then I say, really? 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 You know, again, it's chasing it down. I sound like some predatory animal. Yeah. Uh, how do you follow up after a, a post-show uh, discussion with, with a playwright uh, in terms of just sort of evaluating, debriefing what that was about? Um, do, do you have that? This is a good question. And I recognize you. Jose Cruz Gonzalez. Um, came in, we did his first reading of his first play at LATC, and <laughs> he came in the literary, you know, we're doing a readings of 15 different plays plus three productions, so Mr. Ong comes into the uh, literary offices, and he's just numb. He has no idea where he is or how to process it, and I said, when the dust settles and you go home, Read your play very carefully and very slowly, and you will remember what people have said, and you will remember how it sounded in the actors' mouths. And I, from my understanding, that actually works. <laughs> you know, I, I just was uh, imagining it on the spot. But I then, late, much later, when I did write a play, um, I found it to be true. I found it to be true. So, uh, because, you, but you have to really, you know, it has to be in the middle of the night. You can't do it while you're, you know, while your kids are asking you about their homework. You really have to isolate so that you can remember all of that. Because it's not just about what people said. It's about the energy in the room. So you have to kind of flashback, I guess. Just wait. <laughs> wait for it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's a, a new tool, a new app called Talkbacker, without the E, uh, available at talkbacker.com, and I've, I've been taking a look at it lately. Uh, it's nothing I've been involved with. It's uh, designed to help move some of the conversation that happens in the Talkback onto, I guess, the internet. Um, uh, basically, it allows the playwright and the dramaturg to work together to formulate those questions in advance, enter them into a little app, and then anyone in the audience, I think, with an iPhone can then answer the questions that way. And so it occurs to me that that could have a positive effect in that it would get responses from people who are not likely to speak up in a room, but also then maybe take some of the conversation out of the room and make it happen digitally, and there's nowhere to see what anyone else is saying. So a lot of times I think good questions are inspired by people who've asked earlier questions in a talk back. So A, are you aware of this technology? If not, there you go. Uh, a free gift from me to you. And if, uh, if you know, what do you, what do you think about that? Do you share? Well, we have to find a way, as Todd was saying, we have to find a way to cross over into this new, multi-platform convergence culture, it's called. I, I also happen to teach television, so. Uh, but, uh, and that's what they call it in television, is the convergence culture. So I, I think there has to be ways that we find to cross over into that. Um, or we'll, we're going to get left behind. We just really are. We're going to be dinosaurs. It's going to happen fairly slowly. It's not going to happen in my lifetime, but it's going to happen. Um, so I love that idea. At first, I thought you were talking about sort of a computerized dramaturg, <laughs> which, which they do have, I'm told. There is a, a software program that asks you about your character arcs and stuff like that. But you know, 
I'd rather have you. Are you free? <laughs> I can be. <laughs> I can be had. Actually, I was just talking to, um, I shouldn't tell you this part. I, I was just talking to uh, Gary, and because I think he is just the most terrific person. And my, my longtime colleague, who I call my evil twin, Morgan Jeunesse, um, who worked for Mr. Papp when Mr. Papp was still around, um, and while I was working at the Los Angeles Theater Center, and we loved the same work quite often. And um, so we would use uh, our bosses to play off of each other. So I would say, Mr. Bushnell, if you don't do this play, Mr. Papp's going to do it. <laughs> and it worked, actually, surprisingly well. Um, anyway, my evil twin was an agent for a long time, as you know, and now she is essentially a creative advisor for the agency that you, she used to be an agent for. They pulled her out of the contract negotiations, because God knows dramaturgs are terrible at that, and, and just made her essentially the staff dramaturg for all of the playwrights that they represent. And that is my fantasy. And I am, I am lobbying Mr. Garrison to help me fulfill my fantasy. <laughs> because I, I moved across the country from the West Coast three years ago, and I'm desperately lonely for you all. I, I have not found a theater to work for in the D.C. area, and, uh, and uh, I have two cats, but it's not enough. <laughs> oh, and I have a husband now, but it's still not enough. <laughs> it's still not enough. Yes, darling. So, I just, I, I don't know, I kind of take a little umbrage at, to the, to the uh, point that this is a necessary evil. I, I think, as a playwright, you know, this is my way, on some level, of uh, engaging in conversation with the broader world. And without this talk back, uh, how else do I, you know, how else do I engage? You know, how Don't else do it. am I engaged? I know. I think it's amazing. No, she, oh, he wanted, wanted it. Sorry. Wanted I think her. it's amazing, and so that's why. So, I, so I'm just. I don't know. I get. I, I, I'm. Just, I get the the feeling a little bit that there's a sense like, okay, you know, like as the playwright, you know, you kind of have to be secluded and you know untouchable because you might shatter if someone says, you know, that, you know. Have you ever done a post-play discussion? I have. No, I have. And, you know, the, the biggest thing for me is I always forget things. But, you know, if someone was to say, you know, this place sucked, I would be like, oh, okay, I, I'll take that down. If they were like, I'd love it. You are a rare creature. Well, but I just think, I, I mean, we... I remember, Jose Cruz will remember this, too. At the Hispanic Playwrights thing, uh, a, a colleague of ours named Roy Convoy, who is this fantastic writer, um, it was a post-play discussion. And it was about, it's in process, right? And somebody started to suggest how a scene should go. And he lost it. Hey. He lost it. And he said, don't rewrite the play, as he was walking out of the theater. Yeah. I make comments about society on a daily basis when I sit down at the computer. You know, and they're not always nice. You know what I mean? about all kinds of people. Well, I so wish I, I was still running the theater because <laughs> I could do your work. <laughs> but I, I just, I, I don't know, I guess I, I, guess I just... I, you're, not, you're not fragile. I'm not, I'm not intending to say that. I'm not, not intending to say that. It should be but beautiful, right? It, I mean, it should be, a, it should be a gorgeous experience, the way I look at it. It this, should this be, post, yeah, talk, right, post yeah, talk. sure. Yeah, awesome, thank you. It's That's not, it. it's not going to be beautiful. No. The economics won't let it be beautiful. Okay. Can you elaborate, please? I mean, I know you just... No, it's what Todd was about. just saying. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, should I be a playwright? No. No, 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 no. And I've said that to my students. I've said it to interns at The Magic. I've said it to many, many people. And if you still become a playwright, then you are the gift of God. And that's incredible. That's incredible. And, you know, I mean, it's just, then it's beautiful. Then it's beautiful. Any more? Whoop! Sunglasses. Oh, I'm supposed to stop. Oh, my God, Emily Mann is here. <laughs> okay. Then I, 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 sorry.